Well, everybody, thank you for, for coming on. Um, we're going to go ahead and get this started. We are recording this this webinar, so we'll be sending you a follow-up email with the, the full recording here. Uh, my name is Jeremy Boudinay. I'm the Director of Marketing for Ambition, and we're, we're very excited to host this webinar series with Mary Lou Tyler, uh, a renowned sales development expert, uh, an expert in all things prospecting and outbound. She's the co-author of Predictable Revenue and a new book, uh, Predictable Prospecting, that uh, we will be giving away five copies of to uh, five lucky registrants at the end of this webinar. And we, we got in touch with Mary Lou. We really just absolutely loved everything she preaches. And we wanted to do this webinar series um, as a way for sales development leaders to have a, an immersive, in-depth, um, sort of one-on-one -on -one type uh, course on, on the new cutting-edge ways to run a team. And Mary Lou is the perfect person to, to do it, and we're very, very excited about it. So quick overview of the four sessions we're doing. We're doing one a week for the next four weeks. Uh, the first one is today, Attract and Hire the Right SDRs. Um, from there, next week, we'll be doing how to equip SDRs with the right process and technology. Uh, following week, how to make SDRs more effective at time management. And finally, uh, the final uh, session will be on retaining and enhancing your current SDR talents. So kind of going through the whole spectrum, uh, as sales development leaders, you guys are all on the new frontier um, in, in a sense. <laughs> Very, all of this is very relevant, very timely information. And um, from here, I'm, I'm just going to hand over to Mary Lou, and she's going to take over and, and give an awesome presentation that I've, I've had a chance to look at um, on, on how to attract and hire the best SDR talent for your team. All right. Hi, everyone. Mary Lou Tyler here. Uh, I wanted to let you know that this is a very interactive session. So we've had some very lively webinars of late. And if you have any questions or comments, challenges with what I'm saying, then stick it in the chat session. If we can't answer your question on the webinar, then we are set up to take in all the questions, respond, and when your this deck will be available for download. And we'll include the questions that uh, probably in a subsequent email, somewhere between, you know, session one, session two, we'll answer those questions that we couldn't get to today. So I'm going to talk to you about the SDR role. Now, I, you notice I use SDR, BDR, ADR, <laughs> because since predictable revenue, believe it or not, the SDR role is changing, and I'm sure some of you are experiencing that firsthand. So I included BDR, which is business development rep, and ADR, which is account development rep, and those terms may be used interchangeably, but they're also used when we're thinking about account-based selling now because people are starting to get into that, looking at the top 20, top 30 accounts. And the BDR role or the SDR role may, may change depending on who's doing what with what account, uh, account segment, if you will. But still in all, our role in, as SDR leadership is to really have a focused, aligned, and accountable team. And the way I look at it is a triad, if you will, of people, process, and technology. So in, these, in this webinar series, we're going to go through all of these in various flavors over the next four sessions together, today focusing on the hiring and also the, the testing portion of bringing people on board. Yeah, and uh, just saying, Jerry, real quick, Mary Lou, this is right, right there is why we we wanted to partner with you because ambition. If you talk to Mark Cosclo, VP of Sales at Outreach, or, or any of the other uh, companies that are using us in their SDR teams, this is what ambition does: is align these three uh, uh, segments for you within your organization. So I'm I'm interested, Mary Lou, to see you know where you uh, tackle each one and and how you explain the best practices for each of these and how they they align with with what we're offering. So yeah, go ahead. Just wanted to, wanted to throw that in there real quick. Yeah. And you know, a lot of this is something that I've experienced firsthand. I um, managed 150 SDR persons in a contact center environment. I had a call center where our job was outbound outreach, uh, setting appointments and also sales qualified opportunities back in the day. And when I hooked up with Aaron Ross, we blended in the internet and email engines to 
to essentially facilitate the same type of process. So I, I've been there, I've done it wrong, and had horrible statistics of people hiring. I was just horrible at it. And so I really spent a lot of time over the last five years trying to figure out what the magic formulas are. And that's what I'm going to be presenting to you today. What's worked for me and what's actually in the new book. So in part one, we're going to really help you identify and attract a strong pool of candidates for these roles. Understanding that some of your roles may be split even within the SDR realm based on account-based selling and other types of selling that you're doing product-wise, <clears throat> based on your buying scenarios of how buyers buy from you. And then the second section is really how to train them, how to start getting conscientious. And that's a big word for me right now, because that was the secret sauce, is this word conscientious, uh, in making sure that my hires were going to stick and not lose them. I mean, I think when we first started, we had, even with predictable revenue, we would lose sometimes two out of three hires over the course of the activation portion of the framework. And as you know, that's very expensive. So we had to figure out a way to attract the early guys that are really smart for that role, but also train them that in 18 months or 12 to 18 months, they're going to move up or move out into either account executive position if they want, or an account management position, which is the upsell cross sell and so we had to find people who were good door openers, but also for those who really wanted to move within the organization, we had to be able to make sure that that personality could also work in those other roles. So the first thing we're going to talk about is how to attract these people. And the purpose, obviously, is to help you identify <clears throat> the best sourcing channel for these candidates. Um, I'll show you some of the elements of what I think are compelling job descriptions, and then I'll actually give you an example of a job description. And as I said, these are things that we're going to be downloading for you, so you don't have to write for, you know, feverishly. Will these will be there for you to download? So there are three factors of measurement that, in fact, we discussed this in the book, the new book. Um, uh, of hiring. One is recruiting cost. The other is employee tenure. And the third, I think, is job performance. So those are the three factors of measurement to help us determine whether we've done a good job in hiring. Now, <clears throat> the cost, essentially, it, I, I think everyone knows that if we can get internal referrals, employee referrals, that the recruiting cost is going to be the lowest. Uh, but we actually went further in the book and we looked at a number of studies to validate that, whether that was really something that is true. And sure enough, yes, we did determine that employee referrals have a higher yield. So meaning that the if I recommend someone for the SDR role and I'm an employee of the company, I, I have a better, better chance that that person is going to do a good job and stay longer. So if any of you are looking at these statistics, you know, if you go through a national newspaper, if you go through a local newspaper, if you're doing social advertising through LinkedIn, whatever it is, your yields are just not going to be as high as if you can get an employee referral program in place. So we started working with clients on, on doing that very thing. And it has been one of the best things for us to have a better idea of success and being able to define that and also the tenure of the employee increased. Now this particular study that I'm showing you from the Technion Institute of Technology is missing the agencies. So if you're working through agencies or recruiters uh, or you get direct applicants coming in through social channels, then this study is not really comprehensive enough for us to say by far employee referral is best, but it's definitely leaning that way with this study. Now here's a, another uh, study that we did. Again, this is the International Association Assessment Management Council, and they also confirmed by this particular 10-year sample study that employee referrals are going to stay longer. And you can see the graph to the right. Now, this did include the agencies, uh, the recruiter agencies. So if you're working through a recruiter, if you're doing any type of media ads, and LinkedIn would be one of those, for example, or if 
they come in direct. Um, you can see from this particular graph that if you want to get a good employee for the SDR role and you want them to stay longer, an employee referral system is definitely the way to go. Now, this particular graph combined 11 studies that Jeremy, my co-author, and I found uh, that we could put into the book. So take a look at that for a minute and just sort of let that absorb in. I was really surprised that it was such a big difference between media advertisement um, and employee referral. And look at the recruiter one at 8%. I mean, it's, it's not that great. And they're expensive. The third factor is performance. So we looked at tenure, we looked at cost per employee, and now we're looking at the actual performance of the employee. And we discovered through all of the sources that we looked at that performance on the job is, is independent of recruiting source. So I would be interested uh, for you guys to chime in on that one because we have not been able to find any concrete studies that said uh, one, of the, one of these factors of, we showed here, employee referral, media advertisement, recruiter or direct, they weren't necessarily a marker for how the SDR performed on the job, which means that if you're thinking, if you're cost driven, you're going to really going to look at employee referral as your uh, primary source for recruiting. And then on down, knowing that neither of those or any of those are going to really relate to the performance. What relates to the performance is the next section of the, this webinar, which is all about the testing and the ongoing training of the SDR role. You want to chime in on any of this, Jeremy, or am I going to advance on? Um, I, uh, I, I would love to, but I think we, I honestly do not know. I'd be interested in hearing myself about, um, recruiting source. I mean, if any, if anyone participants wants to, you know, interject, you can use the chat or the Q and a, yeah. um, at the bottom of your screen, by the way. Uh, we, we will accept any insights. <laughs> yeah, we and like I said, we researched because you know for the book you have we have uh, it was published by McGraw Hill, so we have a lot. It's like doing a textbook, so we did a lot of research, and we just couldn't find anything anywhere that said performance. There's a marker or link between performance and recruiting source. So I'd be really interested to hear from our audience as to what they found. So the bottom line on sourcing your SDR, BDR, ADR role is hire via referral when you can and internal referral. Studies are confirming that hiring via referral is the best way to go. Uh, they're also the cheapest in the long run to hire. They stay longer, but this, this performance piece where we're trying to really hone in on uh, specificity around how well are they going to do in this job is not really related to hiring source. So we still have our work cut out for us uh, in terms of making sure that the SDRs are performing at optimum. And real quick, Mary Lou, uh, uh, thank you, Trey Swan, to Sandra Jett, he said from his experience, passive candidates do tend to perform better um, than people that are, that are more actively sought. Um, so, okay. yeah. yeah. You know, this is such a critical role for us and speaking from experience of someone who didn't have success at it for a very long time uh, because my numbers, like I said, uh, two out of three in worst case scenario, I would hire in the contact center would make it. Um, I, ha I have it now down to one in four, which is better, but it would sure be nice to <laughs> even get it better than that because we're spending a lot of time and in, especially in this process the assemble and activation process is just so time consuming and getting them up to speed that it'd be nice to be able to retain them for a long period of time. But there is some help for us and that's coming up in this in latter portions of this presentation. So let's now move to what we consider the elements of a, a pretty good job description. And I just love the internet. I don't know about you guys, but you know, you can see all these job descriptions now on LinkedIn and start comparing notes. So one of the things I'd like you to do now is take your standard job description that you're using today for the SDR role and see if it maps to these particular elements, these four, learning and advancement, day-to-day -day duties, top performer attributes, and then of course your organizational and core value props. Now, the reason why we put language and advancement 
commitment up front is because in all the interviews that we've done over the last five years in preparation for this book, you know, the one, the one question that was asked most frequently is about learning and advancement. And I don't know if it's because Right. I can guess it's because most of the folks in the SDR role are typically coming out of college or they may have a shorter tenure in the sales area. So they definitely want to learn more. And the other thing is, and maybe predictable revenue is, is the result of this, is that we show that path of going from an account, uh, a marketing rep, working inbound leads, advancing to the SDR role, working outbound leads or blended leads if they're doing both inbound and outbound, working up to the AE role. And then of course, if you want to go to account management, then you know that's, that's another role you can look towards. So we were always looking at those as advancement. And that, that by far is what we were asked most about when we interviewed a lot of the candidates for SDR roles. The day-to-day -day duties is very simple, an explanation of what they're doing every day. You know, don't get too caught up in the jargon on uh, the actual top performers and how, how they perform and give them strict requirements of what they need to do and then nice to haves. And then lastly, of course, is the company, what, 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 where you stand, what your core values are. So let's now break those down and under the learning and advancement side, Really, as I said before, the SDRs ask about it mostly. And, you know, I think if you could put the clear path inside of the job description, that would be good for them to see. So we can, I'm giving you these examples here of the, an associate SDR, a senior SDR, an ADR, and performance is, uh, promotions are based on merit and achievement. Now you can see the SDR role is splitting um, in some organizations. So you may have SDRs that just set appointments, which means their talk times in getting from first conversation to an AWAF call, which is are we a fit call, is you know 15 minutes to 45 minutes to an hour, and then they try to set the appointment. The senior SDR it more aligns to the role that was described in predictable revenue, where we did a 315 process which is a 15 minute AWAF call followed by a one hour with one decision maker, probably discovery call, getting an understanding of the lay of the land at the company, followed by a two hour uh, team call. So we would find more prospect personas that uh, we would need in order to build the opportunity. We would perform a full BANT or some type of qualification process where we're getting an understanding of need, timing, fit, and so that's more of a senior role, and that's the role that was described in predictable revenue. Generally, the talk times are longer. It takes, you know, three hours and 15 is probably an outlier now with a lot of the folks using this process, but it's definitely longer. Then we go down to the ADR role where they work just the top 20 accounts for the AEs. One of my clients, Talend, uh, actually did this. They had an ADR role where they worked top 20 and that was tier one segment accounts. And then there was something called extended universe where the ADR uh, worked those accounts, but it was put in an automation sequence and they only responded if they got a reply or a click through that warranted a conversation or the ADR to chase them. So as you're thinking through your job description, have in mind what this role it really is for the SDR. Are you in a position now where you are segmenting even that role? Because that should go into the job description attributes. This is a big, big one. Yeah, and Marilee, if I can interject here, I just want to add, all of this sort of goes back to um, a pretty interesting study, I don't know if anyone's familiar with the book, The Progress Principle, it came out in 2011, and it was this sort of major groundbreaking book on what drives the modern workforce. Um, they did a big analysis of, of all these high-tech companies and all these sort of very emergent, uh, new-age, forward-thinking companies that were doing the things that we now see GE and, and uh, PwC and all these other guys doing. And the number one motivator they found of, uh, of workers today um, across any industry, any profession is a sense of progress, uh, which is exceeds pay, exceeds recognition. So, I mean, from here you can see just having from the very beginning 
um, just the, the notion that you were going to come in here. There's, you will have the framework to, to track progress. There's going to be a very clear sense of how you're performing. There's a very clear path in front of you. Um, that's what a lot of workers, whether consciously or subconsciously, uh, are looking for. Um, yeah. yeah. And so just I think that that dovetails really well with all, all the stuff you're saying, Mary Lou. Yeah, and this is just the SDR role. I mean, I'd include the marketing rep role. And typically, I still have a very few clients uh, who are have marketing reps. I think in predictable revenue, we were looking for 400 leads a month to qual- to justify a marketing rep to handle inbound. So, you know, that's another role that you can add to your job description that would show immediate, you know, here's you go here and then here and then here and then here. So they, there's a lot of what we call micro promotions and that's actually Trish Bertuzzi from the sales development playbook. The author of that book, that's the term that she uses and we borrowed for our book because we liked it so much. But these, these, this idea of micro promotions is really something I think motivates someone in this SDR role because for the most part, it's a thankless position and it's a tough position. So we want to make sure that we do promote and advance and give them, give them an idea of the fact that they're really on merit and on achievement going to get these promotions. The next is the salary range. Uh, usually we don't include it because we wait for them to apply before we figure out what their expectations are. Um, and again, we weed out the ones that, obviously are too high or are thinking of themselves as an AE role perhaps maybe, but um, you know, we're, we're looking really to discuss the money issue once they are calling inbound to us, once we're actually arranging an appointment with them and actually speaking to them. Uh, The other thing is uh, you know, we are, the, the recognition piece is important and this is just for your notes that we do release SDRs quickly if they're not performing right away. I mean, we don't, we do not wait. Uh, for them to turn around. We definitely, since we have a rigorous testing process and we have rigorous metrics that we measure them against, we can't afford to have any dead weight in that part of the organization, as in any organization, but especially in the SDR role. But we also extravagantly reward with those micro promotions, the people who do perform and we have bonus programs in place as well as comp- you know, compensation programs in place depending on the product and service that you're selling. This is an example of a sample job description with all of the pieces filled in. So homework for all of you on this webinar is to get the components and just see how yours, the rhythm of your job description, if it flows similarly, uh, or if you have all these pieces. You should definitely have all the pieces. How it flows is really something that you want to test. And since the SDR, our our world outreach is all about testing. So I would test different uh, pieces of this. You know, the learning and advancement. You may want to move down a bit. We found more success when we put it up front. Uh, but these are, here's an example of one that's filled out. I'll let you kind of look at it and I'll hang it on here for a minute and then we'll move on to the next section. Oops, sorry. Uh, this is the section, the third element, top performer attributes. And I believe this is an active uh, job description from Jeremy's current work at uh, his current employer. I have a question, Mary Lou. The, the GPA requirement. What is? Uh, can you? Is there? What's the the logic um, behind that? Again, this Jeremy is an upmarket company, GML. They're a service organization like a McKinsey or a Gartner. So they are they have the culture of a company like that size and GPA is one of those things that they look for. Makes sense. Gotcha. (laughs) Startups may not have this, but (laughs) they definitely do. (laughs) No, I I, a hundred percent the prestige. I I didn't realize it worked for for one of those, those types of organizations. You have to, you have to have to have the the background for that. 
Cool. Yeah. Yeah. And here's the last section of the organizational core values. So again, take these four sections, align it against your job description, and uh, see if you've got everything. And if you have a really good performing job description and it doesn't have these, I am very interested in seeing that. Um, so if you would connect with me and show me what yours looks like, uh, then we can test it with some of the work that we're doing here. Okay, so now the fun part begins, which is actually hiring them, testing them, validating that they're a good candidate for this role, knowing that you have to keep in mind that there is advancement. Um, I used to be a stickler about, and this is probably what got me in trouble, is I was looking for people who are very habit oriented and you know the people who are the hard worker profiles. But the advancement to an AE role was really difficult for them. So I think while I had a good business developer, they were stuck there because they really couldn't go into that AE role where it is more about the relationship. It is more about, you know, a one-to-one -one type of world. And so I backed off on the heaviness of the hard worker profile, but I do want to see that habit aptitude for sure. So I'll show you what I mean by that. Now, first of all, you have to look at yourself as a manager and, and really see if you are the type of manager that can manage these types of teams. So what I've shown you here is the difference between a traditional sales manager on the right and a, a business development manager. Now, I will admit to you all that I do have sometimes trouble with this at corporations that especially up market where they have a traditional sales manager who decides they want to put in a biz dev department and use him as the manager it generally doesn't work because he's used to his monthly quarterly metrics be you know business development managers as you know are daily we have daily daily goals that we need to meet uh, in order to be able to generate qualified opportunities consistently so that the organization can sail, uh, scale the sales focus is very different too. We're hunting, they're farming. You know, we are, we're duty dating, they're getting married. You know, they're basically working a longer relationship. We're short, sweet, love you and leave you. So that's a different type of manager. The other thing too is we don't have as experienced people on our staff generally. We, we typically hire from college or some other area of work and you know, he may be looking more towards people who are more established, have what we used to call Rolodex, they have relationships, they have uh, referral networks in place. So that's a very different group. So think wholeheartedly where you are on this realm if you're going to be managing these folks because you need to bump over to the left more and be on top of people a little bit more than you're probably used to. And again, I think the biggest thing about this slide, this is from predictable revenue, this little slide, except I've added now this outreach because the outbound role has expanded since predictable revenue to have more of those sub roles we were talking about, um, which means you have to really look at this map and say, okay, where am I really hiring? <laughs> what role do I really want this person for? And make sure that that job description is written for that role. And I think this is another area where I see a lot of clients miss the boat because they just think SDR, but they don't think the, okay, what's the product? What is the talk time to get from initial conversation to qualified op, which is or do we even want to get to qualified op? Do we just want to get to setting the appointment? That's a very different type of person than someone who's going to do a BANT or a full discovery call, maybe with the AE on the call, but still they're, they're holding it. So when I did this role, for example, I was an SDR that fed three AEs, but I took it all the way through to qualification. And then I had three different levels of qualification depending on the product or the way people were buying the product. So you can see it gets a little complex, but if you create a map like this, then you'll really understand what your job description should look like uh, because you're really hiring for a certain role within the role, so to speak. And then that inbound, again, I didn't 
outline it for this because we were talking more about outreach, but that's another role that can be included for an entry level if you have the number of inbound leads, and I think we recommended 400 uh, for that person to work. Another thing I want you to think about is aligning the skills with the funnel. Now here's a sample funnel. This was stolen from somebody, I think Talent, um, which is a funnel where they had uh, Europe, they had USA, they had different splits of inbound versus outbound. They weren't pure outreach, they, they were blended. So you can see that the funnel here is dictating a little bit okay, what is this person really going to do for us? Um, so make sure that you're looking at the funnel, looking at the role, the, the cues, these cold working qualifying identified, how far are they going down with that role and whether or not they're blended inbound and outbound and whether or not it's a strictly email versus a blended email phone versus a third type of sequence, uh, which is called immersion, where they're doing a lot of intraday phoning. So those are the kinds of things as you're walking through, who is this person that I really want? The funnel is a very important part of that design of the job description. And I'm just giving you an example here of a, a I think a typical funnel, but yours may be different, but this is one that, that I run it against a lot. Any comments on that, Jeremy, before I go? Yeah, we have a question from uh, Edward Hughes. Is, is each row a different role? He, he wants to know. Each role is a stage of the active pipeline. And each color is the function. So the orange are basically marketing qualified lead flows. The, light, the dark blue is outreach. And the rows are how far we expect the rep to go in order to determine that it's a ready to go lead to be passed over to the next sales role. So if I walk you through one, uh, there's a role here, the ADR role, who has to create personalized templates, hyper-personalization is what it's called now. They also have to respond to Marketo's cold email engine. They have to generate their own leads. That's that working row. They generate their own leads. They actually qualify their own leads. And then they hand it off to a quota-carrying executive to go all the way down. Thank you. That's great, Mary Lou. And uh, we have another question. And actually, I'm glad. Thank you for asking this, Sarah, because I was going to ask if you didn't. Uh, when you say you look for 400 leads to hire an inbound rep, do you mean 400 a month, 400 a quarter? What's the time frame? 400 a month. Gotcha. So that rep is, is going to be responsible for those 400 each yep. month. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. And that this was back in predictable revenue days. So it... You know, I've yet to see a client that gets up to that number, but that's the number we, we saw at Salesforce for sure. Gotcha. A month. Any more questions on that? This is a, giving you an example of the tenure or experience. Remember we talked about a lot of times we get fresh outs from college, but again, think about your average deal size now and the business developer and their experience necessary. So remember I talked before about a 15 minute AWAF call and then the lead was handed off versus a three hour 15 scoping sequence where it's a 15 minute AWAF followed by an hour with one decision maker followed by two hours with multiple decision makers. That may be the 100K plus project for example. So this is coming again from Trish uh, and I love this graph because it really helps you understand the years of experience that they've researched that are necessary to sell an average deal size. So that 2.3 at the top row says 2.3 years of, of sales experience is desired if they're selling a 100K plus project. Any questions on that? 
All right, here we go. Mary Lou's favorite section, <laughs> the tests. <laughs> Only because I failed so many times at this <laughs> that, that I am like totally, it's funny when you finally realize that, oh, okay, this is, this is really what I need to do to get these guys onboarded <laughs> before <laughs> we get them in their seat. So um, essentially, this is a really great slide. The worst thing that we can do, which is what I used to do, is face-to-face -face interviews. You know, just talk to them on the phone, listen to their phone voice, look at the tone, you know, listen to the tonality, make sure that they're smiling as they're talking like I am now, and, you know, that they have really good phone voice. I thought that was half the battle. And tonality is 75% of what we need on the phone. But that wasn't enough. I would get it, we would get them in, and really they weren't, they weren't performing the way we had hoped. So now we add in a few more tests. Now, Jeremy, my co-author of the book, uses this GMA test, a general mental ability. Again, he's up market. They have stricter requirements. They're looking for that GPA. They're looking for someone who is, you know, a college grad who is done some uh, study in uh, areas and is focused on getting good grades. This is something that we discovered added just volumes of increase if we actually did that test. So these tests are all outlined in the book. And for those of you who are want to explore this, I can get the most recent versions of where to find how to conduct these tests. But what this is saying is that just doing a general mental ability test is 20% 26% effective versus a face-to-face -face interview that's only 14. And if you add a face-to-face -face interview to the GMA, it only increases it by 4%. So it's not, it's not that you add 26 plus 14 because you've done those two tests. But if you do a face-to-face -face interview or a virtual interview using the new tools, at most you'll get 30% effectiveness and that's just not good enough. You know, that's, that's a, we're spending a lot to hire people. Now these are coming out of the university of Iowa and Michigan state. So I have connections into the university of Iowa to get their most recent tests that they, that they're doing uh, so that I can pass them along. Now the next one, the work samples and hands-on simulations, every one of you will want to do these. And I put some examples and I have lots of examples of what to do with this. One example is, is the following. It's having them write an email and having them write an email that's gonna be at the cold queue, which is that first stage, the working stage, which is when they found the right person and now they're getting ready to do an AWAF call. So that's a hyper-personalized type of email. Have them write those. And then the other thing is to test them on their objection handling, for example. And I'll show you that in just a minute. The next test is a conscientiousness test. That's hard for me to say. <laughs> and that adds another 10 points on top. So your 30% face-to-face plus GMA now goes to 40% just with a conscientiousness test. And what that is all about is habit. And I'll show you that in just a second. The last one is sales aptitude, which there's a lot of tests out there now that people use for sales aptitude. So that increases as well on top of the face-to-face -face and the GMA by another 10 points. So the work samples, the GMA is the cognitive. The work samples are emails, it's role-playing phone conversations, it's crafting voicemail scripts, the conscientiousness test, and that's out of the University of Iowa, is, is, you know, we want reps who are more likely to set goals and who are committed to goals because especially at the SDR role, it's all about habit. It's all about coming in every day. It's working your block time. It's doing your meaningful conversations to get to that number on a daily basis. This is an area that I see more often than not where SDRs fail by far is right here in this area. And then the last one is sales aptitude, which most of you know, the, the DISC, all those different tests that, that really <clears throat> test the sales effectiveness of the person that you're hiring. So here's this, one of my favorite samples of role playing for phone. Now you'll, where that orange arrow is, you'll see that these are the topics that we want the SDR 
to perform. Now, when you're hiring, you can't obviously give them all these tests, but what I would do is I would find out where your gaps and your leaks and your lags are in the pipeline, where, you know, where people are getting stuck and compile a list of those conversations and test the SDR on those that are in, inbound coming in. Now you're probably wondering, how can I test them on an objection from my company? You don't. You basically ask them to pick a topic that they're passionate about, that they know a lot about. And from that topic, that's where you start asking them the objections or trying to get them around the gatekeeper or whatever it is that you're having trouble with in your organization, in your department, put those questions in. So the first five or six are find the right person call. That's at FTRP. That's a big part of the SDR role is to navigate through the organization, validate that you have the right guy so that you can continue the conversation. Now, the tools will get you pretty far in finding who the right guy is. But if you're working in enterprise, I mean, Gartner was a client of mine. We had, I think, 20 marketing roles that we worked with them on for persona development. How the heck are you going to know which one of those 20 are really focused on your product? So you do need to make some calls into the organization to map and find the right person. So that's a good one. The AWAF call is the are we a fit? And that's a top level qualifier call. You work them through the, the receptionist, the gatekeeper, and the decision maker. Those are the three options that we test on. And then the C-band, that, what that is, is a qualification call or a disqual call, again, with the decision maker, a key stakeholder, and then objection handling. So, for example, if someone likes football, <laughs> you know, that that's something that they know a lot about, then you test them on the ins and outs of that and throw an objection or two at them as you're testing. I would record the call, let them know that you're going to call it, record it, and then that way you can listen to it afterward and note the tone inflections, note how they stuttered, note how many ums and hmm and likes and, you know, whatever their language is, because that's what the prospects are going to hear. So you want to make sure that they sound crisp, they sound clean, they have great tonality, and they're not afraid to use that phone. This is an example of a role playing, but it also is used for testing and hiring. Now this one is essentially the ADR sample intraday calling sequence. So what we're doing here is we're actually going to ask them to write a couple of emails and we're going to ask them to map into a fictitious organization looking for the people in and around the bullseye of direct and indirect influencers in order to be able to build out the org chart so that they can have that are we a fit and discovery call. You can see from this one, the work cadence and the workflow of an ADR is pretty darn busy. So you wanna make sure that they're gonna be ready for this type of workflow because this is typical. This one is one I use with my clients. That I'm giving you right out of a playbook that I did. Okay, which if you'll notice here what this is saying, week two, the orange, if you look down that middle row where it says bullseye, what this ADR is expected to do is take those top 20 accounts, maybe pick 10, and dial in and around the bullseye of direct and indirect influencers until they reach somebody. And they do that after email number three, and they do it again after email number seven. The goal is 95% connect rate. So they are on the phone a lot. And if you're hiring for an ADR role, then this graph is going to help you figure out whether they have good phone skills and whether they're going to be doing this type of calling. It's important that they know how to do it uh, and they're comfortable doing it before you hire them. This is an example of an email writing test <clears throat> that I give to client or to SDRs. And what we're looking for is not necessarily that they know how to write an email, but we're looking to see how they put an email together. So I just did a test uh, last week, actually, for an SDR and had her write an email that was selling some fictitious product that she, I think, it, I can't remember the name of the product, but it was something that she knew about. And so she wrote an email. And I looked for these in orange. These are the parts of an email that we eventually teach the SDRs how to do 
so that each email that they write, whether it's hyper-personalized or whether it's used inside of a stream, is going to be hitting each of these constructs. The first is to trigger. Here we use the trigger of curiosity. Then we're looking for, you know, basically, here's <clears throat> what we can give you. Here's the outcome or obstacle of what you're experiencing, the outcome we can give you, and then the opportunity followed by a call to action. Now, a lot of times they're not going to write the call to action because we have to teach them how to do that. But we're looking to see if, if they include some of these constructs in the email or if they're just rambling. You know, we want to see that and how much work we're going to need to do in order to get them to be good writers. If you decide that they are going to write their emails as a hyper-personalized action, which ADRs will write their own emails, at least get a template going and then hyper-personalize it with research that they're doing. Now, this is another one that I personally think is the cornerstone of a good SDR. And it's all about the day in the life. This was discussed in Predictable Revenue, and I've honed it even more so uh, for predictable prospecting. But it's essentially that conscientiousness test this is the daily life of an SDR, daily. So now you have SDRs on staff. Are they, are they on the phone this much? Are they working the way this particular uh, workflow is showing? Because they should be. For example, block time. And I think you mentioned Mark from Outreach. They call it time blocking. But it's basically taking time out of the day and you are doing nothing but phone calls. You're not checking email, you're not researching, your solo activity is calling. For two hours is what we, we ask them to work up to. For fresh outs, I usually start them at 45 minutes and work them up to two hours, somewhere in that time frame. The goal of this, obviously, is to get five meaningful conversations a day, which is a predictable revenue number, yielding the amount of opportunities for predictable revenue is eight to ten opportunities a month. So absorb this because this is the type of daily workflow that your SDR, no matter what role they're playing, whether it's an SDR, BDR, ADR, are going to end up needing to do in order to generate the opportunities you're looking for. I'd like to segment out all the research pieces for hyper-personalization in our blocks that they don't have good call results. So usually it's sometime, you know, in the late afternoon that they do their research for the following day's phone work. And when they go home, that's it. They they come in the next day, they've done all the research, and they just go through their block time. Now, we've organized this particular role or this workflow can be organized in, in CRMs like Salesforce by using those stages that we saw in that funnel. So if I'm in the working stage and I've got my top 20 accounts, I've done the research on them. I just, when I come in, I click on that URL and it shows all 20 and I start at the top and I work my way down and I do not stop until I've got them all called or two hours is hit, whatever comes first. You want to respond to any of that, Jeremy? No, I, uh, I mean, you nailed it. I think it all goes back to, you know, working backwards, starting with the goal, mm -hmm. you know, having that, that first and foremost, and then having the, the process clearly, you know, makes sense in terms of showing how each step helps, helps reps achieve it. And I think this is a great way to block, um, you know, is a great way to sort of focus people. Um, yeah. And, and this is a ramp. I mean, this is not something they're going to come in from a new hire day one. Uh, like I said, I, I try to get them started at 45 minutes. I see them fidgeting after half an hour, then, okay, you know, they're not, they're not ready to go for 45 minutes yet, but we have a very nice sloped ramp up to two hours. And some people, because they understand the concept of best time to call, will move that two hour block early AM, like 7.30, they may come in. And I've done a test, test with clients where we had them do the nine o'clock, eight o'clock to nine o'clock, eight o'clock to 10 o'clock connects were horrible. I moved them to 730 and all of a sudden within a half an hour, they had all their connects. So this is what we mean by conscientiousness. The fact that they're going to on their own try 
oh, well, if nine o'clock's not working, let me move it to 7.30 or let me move it to 5.30 at night. These are the, that's the mentality that you need in this role. And I tell you, I, I see more of the opposite where if you give them a time, they'll go into that time or they'll fidget. And we, that's not an SDR role. We can't have those type of people in this role. It will never work. So where you can learn more is this new book that's out now. It was released in August. Uh, it's essentially the second generation of predictable revenue. Uh, it's filled with examples and how to. So those emails that I was showing you, uh, that sample of all these components that are needed to make sure that the email is persuasive, we go through in detail. And I think I, there's a section where I'm trying to sell Jeremy on a product. So I wrote, you know, I have emails in there of how to do that. Uh, so it's a full guide with that. And for the more advanced person, but I think it, it's something that would be a good resource if you're looking to at least figure out these tests that you want to perform with the SDR hire. There's a lot of information in the book that can help you do that. And that is the end of my deck. Awesome. Mary Lou, thank you so much. Um, and I've only got a few minutes left here. Does anyone have any questions um, for Mary Lou? Any comments um, about the deck? Feel free to, to chime in now while, while you've got her, got her here in front of you. And Mary Lou, can you tell people um, you know, a little bit more about what prompted you uh, while we're waiting to, to write predictable prospecting? Oh, sure. Yeah. Uh, you know, I've been uh, doing this now for going on almost 28 years in lead generation, various forms, prior to the internet, and um, have always been trying to figure out why people start conversation and what leads up to that first conversation or follow-up conversation. So it culminated in predictable revenue in 2011 based on the case study of a little company called Salesforce. <laughs> and, you know, I started getting out in the field working with clients and I would see them getting stuck in what predictable revenue called sell the dream, <laughs> which is, you know, actually getting people to move and advance into the active pipeline so the last five years, I've just been working with clients trying to figure out a good formula for that. And that's what predictable prospecting is, is, you know, that next generation of this is what you need to do in order to engage people in conversation. Content is important, but content based on behavior for us at top of funnel is even more important. So I put a little map in there of what content to include in your emails, depending on what behavior they're in, whether they're unaware, aware, interested, evaluating, that kind of thing. And so, yeah, the, know, running around with this book. The, the specificity is, is amazing. We actually have real quick, we have a couple questions coming in. Um, first question, I think the quickest ones from, from Jeff, uh, the great information. Can we get a copy of this deck? Yes. Yes, we will. We will actually, uh, uh, I know merely you're trying to do a, a PDF version of this, right? I sent it to you already in your yep. private email. So absolutely you to grab it and give it to them. Yeah. Yep. You guys will have it by the end of the week. Um, and then next question, uh, any red flags when you run, uh, into someone in an interview or ways you can tell they'll be good at blocking their time? That, you know, whoever asked that question, yay, that's the sure. biggest thing. <laughs> that is the biggest thing you can tell because um, a lot of times what I do, and I show this in another presentation, is I show people my personal block time. You know, like when I walk the dogs, when I exercise, <laughs> I have everything blocked out as to when I work, when I don't. So I would just ask them, tell me about your daily life on the weekends. Like, what do you do? And, and then, you know, if they were in a previous role, in sales, you can ask them what their day in the life was there. And if you'll, you'll see whether they naturally block things out or if they're running all over the map. We, we, what we don't want is heavy duty multitaskers. What we do want is people who think serially and will actually conform to this, you know, one thing at a time instead of multiple things at a time. Great answer. Um, yeah, that's, that's, Amazing, Mary Lou and Sarah, thank you for asking. And then final question from Edward. Um, have you read Blueprints for a SaaS sales organization by Jakob Vanderkush Van and Fernando Pizarro? No, but it sounds interesting. What, what's Blueprint about? I'll have to look it up. 
Yeah, uh, jo- that's uh, I know Mark Kosko is a disciple of, of Jocko's. And, and then a uh, follow-up question to that is, uh, do you plan on writing more about other parts of, of the funnel? Uh, no, because frankly, my expertise is from starting conversations with people we don't know and getting them to qualify to op. I, I, go, I go glazed eyes over when it goes from off to close. <laughs> I, I, I always tell people I'm more of a kind of love them and leave them kind of gal. So <laughs> I stay atop a funnel. <laughs> I gotcha. No, that's, that's a great, great, <laughs> great response. I'm going to steal that for you, Luke. Um, okay. Well, I, I know we're out of time here, guys. So uh, thank you to everyone who, who came and, and asked questions and participated. We'll uh, have a recording of this to you shortly. Uh, if you're watching this on recording, we're sorry you, you couldn't make it for the actual uh, live presentation, but we're glad you signed up and we're glad you're watching this. And Mary Lou, can you tell people um, how they can contact you directly with any specific questions based off of this, this session? Oh yeah, sure. Um, you can reach me on LinkedIn, Mary Lou Tyler. So it's LinkedIn slash in slash Mary Lou Tyler. Twitter is Mary Lou Tyler. And then my email address is Tyler dot Mary Lou, M A R Y L O U, at gmail.com. Send me a message there. There's also on my website, Mary Lou Tyler dot com slash ask Mary Lou, all stuck together, all lowercase. I put a voicemail widget thing on there. So if you click on that, you can leave me a 90 second question on there. And I answer all of those as well. Awesome. And then final thing, guys, um, next week we are doing session two, how to equip SDRs with processes and technology, same format, same wonderful host, uh, November 2nd <laughs> from 12 PM to 1 PM Eastern time. So, uh, please sign up for that and, uh, everyone have a great rest of your day. Thank you so much. Bye. Thanks, Mary Lou. Bye-bye.